Hi everyone, welcome and good evening, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Claire, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Ian Morris, who is here with his new book, Geography is Destiny, Britain's Place in the World, a 10,000 year history. He'll be in conversation with Jane Smiley. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our ever growing digital community during these challenging times. Thank you for joining us tonight in support of our authors and just the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Our events calendar is starting to wind down for the summer, but we still have plenty of events on the calendar. Um, you can check it out on the website at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and even browse our shelves from home. After this introduction, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat to order Geography as Destiny. Your purchases make this virtual event series possible and now more than ever support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. And this event, evening's event will include some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, just go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. The event also has closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable the captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption live transcript button on your screen. Uh, and finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings the past two years, um, technical issues might arise. And if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. We thank you for your patience and understanding. Ian Morris is an historian, archeologist and author. He's the Jean and Rebecca Willard Professor of Classics and Professor in History at Stanford University and has directed excavations in Britain, Greece, and Italy. He's the author of more than a dozen books, including the critically acclaimed Why the West Rules for Now. He'll be in conversation this evening with Jane Smiley, who is the author of Greenlanders, Ten Days in the Hills, and the Last Hundred Years Trilogy, as well as the Pulitzer Prize winning A Thousand Acres. Her most recent book is Perestroika in Paris. In perhaps the most famous speech in Shakespeare's Richard II, John of Gaunt enumerates the great deeds of the English and the natural advantages of the British Isles over continental Europe. Known as the Sceptered Isles speech, it's been oft quoted by historians and statesmen. In his new book, Ian Morris takes a fresh look at British history, exploring how England's geographical place in the world set the stage for the strategic decisions that changed world history and he considers what the future might hold in a post-Brexit world with an ascendant China. In the Times, Robert Coolville raves, at his core task of cramming 10,000 years of history into a single book, Morris succeeds triumphantly. If you wanna read about Seneca triggering a first century credit crunch, or the connection between Stonehenge and the World Economic Forum, or the political identity of Robin Hood, this is the book for you. It certainly gave me a new appreciation for the, how the world shaped Britain and how Britain in turn reshaped the world. And in a starred review in the Library Journal says, uh, Morris provides a very comprehensive history of Britain while keeping readers engaged. It's a skill to cover such a vast timeline and still keep a reader wanting more. A satisfying read for both those new to British history as well as those looking for a new take. And so now I'm very pleased to turn things over to tonight's speakers. Uh, Ian and Jane, the uh, virtual podium is yours. Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to begin because I talked Ian into letting me read the first paragraph of the book because I want you to know if you haven't read his other books, what a wonderful and readable and intriguing and also amusing style he, ha he has. And so I'm going to read the first paragraph fog in the channel. When I was a boy, my grandfather told me over and over again that when he'd been my age, weather reports used to say, fog in the channel, continent cut off. Like so many jokes, the humor was in the ambiguity. Was granddad saying the country had gone to the dogs or that the English were comically self-important or both or neither, he never told. But 40 odd years on from the last time he shared it, the joke feels edgier. On the 23rd of June, 2016, the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union. Before the week was out, the prime minister had fallen, 
the third of four conservative premiers in a row to go over Europe. The Labour Party's members of parliament had voted no confidence in their own leader and a 20 and a two and two trillion of the world's wealth had evaporated. Not funny. So that is a good example of Ian's wonderful style. And so now we're gonna ask him some questions. Um, my, my first question for you, Ian, is what inspired this book? Yeah, well, well, first of all, I thank you for, for reading that first paragraph. It sounds so much better when you read it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me want to re read it myself. But yeah, this, um, well, I, I, I started my career as a fairly straightforward archaeologist and historian of ancient Greece, you know, working on particular times and places. And then, um, actually, right back when I was writing my PhD thesis, I realized if you kind of um, enlarge the, the size of the picture you're looking at, geographically and chronologically, kind of new answers start to pop up to the questions you're asking. So I spent several years doing this, and the stage gets bigger and bigger and bigger, until I'm looking kind of at the whole world over thousands of years. And it dawns on me one day that um, I'm actually now less interested in enlarging the framework in order to come up with new answers to the traditional questions about one particular place, but more interested now in the larger framework itself. Itself, about, you know, talking about global things. So I, I write several books along um, these lines, trying to theorize about world history at very long time scales. But all the time, sort of nagging away at me in the back of my mind is the, the conventional historian thing that, you know, that, that's all very well. But actual history is, is made by real people in particular mm -hmm. times and places. And you can theorize about the world all you like. At the end of the day, if you can't zoom back in from these grand theories to a particular question, then mm -hmm. the grand theories kind of aren't worth so much. Mm -hmm. So this has been going on for a while. I've been thinking this. I'm thinking, you know, I should write a book where I take my, my big geographical theories, bring them down to a particular time and place. And then I wake up on June 24th, 2016 and say, aha, <laughs> <laughs> people, in their wisdom, have just given me the perfect test. <laughs> Thing. How kind of them? <laughs> yeah. Do, do we get a better idea of what happened and why by looking at it on this long time scale mm -hmm. or, or do we not, basically? And of course, I come to the conclusion, yes, we do. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had a book to write and I wouldn't be sitting here now. Well, that makes perfect sense. Um, but given how long it is, you know, it's 10,000 years and um, you are an archaeologist. I was curious about what bits were most interesting for you? Yeah, well, um, the, the 10,000 year thing, I kind of got into that because I realized, well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say that you, the, the best way to understand what's going on in the British Isles currently, or actually in any part of the world currently, is by looking back over the long run to try to understand what are the principles that have driven the history of this place. And hmm. the best way to do that is to kind of go back to the absolute beginning and see your know, other things that have remained constant, at least in some sense, over really long periods of time. And Britain is very convenient in this regard, because until somewhere between eight and 10,000 years ago, there actually are no British Isles because Britain is part of the European oh. continent. You have this great big land shelf sticking out of the North Atlantic. And it, of course, becomes islands um, by when the, the Ice Age ends, the glaciers melt, sea levels rise, and you know, somewhere between 8,000 and 6,000 BC, um, the islands become isles. So I figured, okay, I've got to look at this long-term history going back all the way 10,000 years. But then, yes, that does sort of present this problem. There's a lot of it. And, uh, and you know, th those of you who are interested in British history will know that sort of you know, per head of population, there are probably more historians and archaeologists operating in the British Isles than just about anywhere on the planet. So it's just this overwhelming amount of stuff. And um, I also find, you know, perhaps this tells you more about me than about any of the subjects I write on, just whatever the bit is I'm writing at the moment, this always seems to be the most fascinating bit to me. Mm. Um, but, you know, because that's said, I mean, there are particular bits that um, do sort of stick with me. I loved writing about King Arthur. I'd never had an excuse to write about King oh, Arthur. Oh, really? And uh, most, um, uh, again, if you follow uh, British, the, the scholarship on British history much, you'll know that King Arthur is really out of fashion. 
um, you know, for the you know, reasonable reason that he probably didn't exist. I mean, there is that mm -hmm. little detail. But even so, that never used to stop people going on and on about King Arthur. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I realized writing this story, looking at the long term, the important thing with King Arthur is not so much what he did or didn't do, particularly if he didn't exist in the first place, yeah. but what people make of him. He becomes this um, mm -hmm. hugely powerful symbol for about a thousand years of uh, what it is that theoretically holds the British Isles together. That was just sort of fascinating getting oh, into yeah, that. That's but, interesting. You know, everything I was looking at, I thought, oh, God, this is this is such a cool bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting. Um, OK, so I have to admit to other to the people who are watching that when you and I man, discussed this book a little bit, uh, a little while ago, you said that you didn't think people would be very interested in Great Britain anymore. And I was wondering why you thought that. Yeah, well, um, I think that you know, there was a lot of interest all around the world right after the Brexit um, explosion uh, <laughs> happened. Um, but then, um, I found that I sort of writing this book, I was in a little bit of a bind because there was a certain attraction to trying to do it as a, a current affairs kind of book and have the book mm -hmm. get and come out fairly shortly after the Brexit decision. And I think well, you know, when I did the day after the vote, when I decided I wanted to write a book of this kind, you know, I was acutely aware that hundreds, maybe even thousands of other authors were deciding exactly the same thing mm -hmm. or had already decided it. And in fact, you know, the first books about Brexit appeared within weeks of the referendum. You know, people clearly had got these up their sleeves, ready to go into production and just needed to tweak the ending a little bit, depending on how the vote went. Um, so, you know, that, that was one possibility. But of course, the problem with that is um, I wouldn't be very good at it. I, I don't have any particular, not like I'm on first name terms with all the politicians or anything. I wouldn't have anything particular to say. Uh, the hmm. way I, the, the thing that made me feel like I did have something to say was that I knew that very few of these other people were going to be approaching this as a, a really long term question. How does this mm -hmm. fit into this 10,000 year story? But to write a book like that, that just takes a bit of time. And um, and I found actually the, the big problem I had, uh, the problem came from the fact that I did grow up in the British Isles. I went to school there and there was all this stuff that I'd learned along the way while doing British archaeology when I was younger. All this stuff um, that I thought I knew about the British past that it turned out I in fact didn't know because well, it, that's it's all changed sometimes because I got it wrong to start off with but I guess this is always the way that it's not the things you don't know that get you it's the things you think you know and then it turns out you're wrong mm. so the the book it took you know it took longer than I'd intended to write and I was rather concerned that by the time it comes out people are just gonna say oh my god you're not another book about <laughs> <laughs> anything but <laughs> well uh, one of the things you do write about toward the end is um, the sort of shrinking of the British Empire and, mm. and in, in a way Brexit symbolizes England going back to itself um, rather than essentially having expanded itself all over the world. And I actually thought all the stuff about the British Empire was not stuff I learned in school and was quite, and I thought that was quite interesting actually. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, um, okay, so here's a couple of more questions. Um, so I wrote, you, you've written several mega histories, all of which I've loved. And the thing I've always wondered about when I read them is, why do you think humans fight so much? It just seems like it's one war after another. Does that seem to you like nature or nurture? Um, or are there human groups that are more peaceful than ours, I guess you would say? Do you have any, since you had to write about so many wars, did you come up with a theory about that? Yeah, well, this is something I think you know, almost anybody interested in history, you have to think about it at least a little bit. And mm -hmm. um, when I was writing one of my earlier books called Why the West Rules for Now, as I was writing that, I, I would draft a chapter and then um, pass it on to my wife to get an expert commentary on it to see what, you know, what, what somebody actually think reading this. And so one time, you're fairly early on the manuscript, I'd given her one chapter and asked, what do you think? And she said she liked it, but I could tell there was something else she wanted to say. It was like this pregnant pause. And so she said, well, you know, I liked it, but there's a lot of fighting. 
I think this worried me because uh, I thought, well, am I misunder? Am I getting it wrong here? Is this just like me that's coming through them wicked person? So all this fighting is in there, and uh, yeah, this sort of worried me a little bit. Then I realized, well, no, actually, doing this sort of work, you there is a lot of fighting. There's just no way around this basic fact. This is such an important mm-hmm. part of human history, and that actually pushed me into writing a completely separate book about the history of war, um, because yeah. I, then the question starts to nag at me, well, why is there so much violence in the story? And I, I guess that's sort of the conclusion I came to uh, about this is, I mean, the, it's sort of obvious that there will be a lot of fighting in the human story because like, uh, we are just the same as all the other animals out there. We've evolved biologically and pretty much every species of animal out there has got, not, not quite every, but, body, but nearly all of them, they've got the potential to use violence to solve their problems. If, if they mm. want to, they can fight over something. And so people are no different from all the other animals in that regard. The thing that, though, that does make us different is that you know, our biological evolution have given us these great big brains that are like the miracle of creation. As far as we know, there's nothing like them in the entire universe. And these big brains give us the capacity to evolve culturally as well as biologically. And Mm -hmm. um, like different species of animals can evolve toward using violence less or using it in different ways as they evolve biologically. And we do that too. But we can also look at problems and say, oh, you know, killing everybody over this, this is kind of not a good idea. Mm. And um, I think this is the thing that makes us so different from other animals, because I think there's reasonably good evidence that, say, comparing the Stone Age to nowadays, um, your chances of dying violently, the average global chance of somebody dying violently, dying violently is like one tenth of what it was in the Stone Age. Oh, is that um, right? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, no other animal has ever done anything like that. They, um, no other animal is able to change by force of will how much violence it uses and under what circumstances it uses it. And there's still you know, way more violence in the world than I think most of us would like. But um, it is a very uplifting story, in a way, our ability to master the use of violence in our lives. Oh, well, thanks for the hope. <laughs> <laughs> And please tell your audience the name of your book about war, because I, that was another one that I found really interesting. Yes, uh, yeah, important um, thing to remember. Yeah, that's called War, What Is It Good For? Nice, easy title to remember. <laughs> well, yeah, somebody, I'm sorry, somebody else came up with the title before you did, but <laughs> no, I thought that was a fascinating book. Oh, thank you. And um and your theory was it wasn't just good for killing off a lot of people. It had other, it had other as- aspects that yeah, yeah, were helpful like, too. Like a lot of things um, in evolutionary stories, violence has had a paradoxical kind of role because one of the things under certain circumstances, one of the things that can happen when a group of people start to have more violence at their disposal than others, is they they use that advantage in violence to take control over other groups of people. And then when they've done that, generally what they want is for these other groups of people to work for them or pay them taxes or whatever. The last thing they want is for people to carry on using violence to solve their problems. So mm. governments, you know, one of the big things governments have always done is suppress the use of violence within the territory they control. And mm. so, like, again, you know, like it very, very common in evolutionary stories of all kinds um one a trait will often turn out to be sort of a self-defeating trait and so the the violence that creates the governments because you know ultimately all of our governments do come down to the use of force so they mm-hmm. claim to have a monopoly of the legitimate use of violence and i mean if you, you if you doubt that just stop paying your taxes sooner or later men with guns will show up at your house and take you away this is what it all rests on um but the ability of one group to monopolize legitimate violence of that kind scares the rest of us straight and drives us toward not using a violence so much so it is a sort of peculiar tangled story but i think this is often how these stories I mean, like the the story about the british isles as well how they turn out in the long run is a sort of very paradoxical looking hmm um, well, then, what would you say was the most dangerous period in English history that you learned about while you were researching and writing the book? Yeah, I suppose that the, the, that you have to ask, well, you know, dangerous for whom? <laughs> because there's been plenty of periods in 
uh, in the history of the British Isles where the British were most dangerous to themselves. <laughs> and then of course other oh, okay. people, um, when they've been uh, rather more dangerous to the rest of the world. And um, there's a, in terms of their danger to people outside the British Isles, it would be certainly the, the 18th and 19th centuries um, in one sense would be the period when the British were kind of the most, one of the most dangerous peoples on the planet because they mm -hmm. had an industrial revolution before anybody else. They had the ability to project power globally and use it to impose their will on other people. Although mm -hmm. having said that, you could also say equally well that the British have been at their most dangerous since they um, got their own nuclear weapon. Uh, because mm -hmm. British don't have the power to kill hundreds of millions of people the way the, the Americans and Russians do, mm -hmm. but they do have the power to start a nuclear war that could kill hundreds of millions of people. So mm -hmm. I, like so many of these questions, I think it all depends on, on how, how you define the terms within. Mm -hmm. And would you say that there was any period in the, in the 10,000 years that you would call a golden age? Yes, again, uh, your golden age for whom and under what, what sort of circumstances? Mm -hmm. I would say maybe for, for most of the people in Britain. Um, the golden age would be now, although a lot of people in Britain would disagree. But uh, in often, if you read the British press, there's often this sense of doom and gloom, um, which I think underlying that is this consciousness that your know, Britain used to be the, the, the great player on the global scene and now it mm -hmm. isn't anymore which is, is absolutely true. Um, although uh, judged in terms of the, the wealth of the British Isles and, and their military capacity, and certainly the intellectual and cultural capacity of the British Isles, um, it punches way, way above its weight even now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, I mean, the reason now is the golden age is that you know, back in the 19th century when the British Empire was at its height, the typical British person lived 30 years less than they do now, earned mm -hmm. 10, 15 times less over the course of their lifetime. By the time you got in, if you survived infancy, by the time you got into your 40s, you were probably in constant discomfort from you know, joint pain and rotten teeth, <laughs> all kinds of things going on. And um, you know, my, my day job as a professor of ancient history, and this is something I always do tell the students on the first day if you think the ancient world was great you by the end of this course 10 weeks from now you're not going to think that anymore the ancient world was terrible um if you were given the choice of when to live um now is the only time any rational person would pick hmm. okay that's that's sort of reassuring um <laughs> <laughs> well speak you mentioned um the industrial revolution but did you when you were writing about the industrial revolution did did it did you think about it any differently than from the way you used to? Um, it... mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I mean, when when I was a student, the this sort of standard storyline uh, about the Industrial Revolution still tended to emphasize this is the, the product of these great geniuses, these um, you know, unsung heroes, these engineers who'd come up with all these, these, these inventions, these amazing names, like Arkwright's Throstle, that was my favorite of these you know, cotton spinning machines that people were coming up with. Um, and it was the story of the, the heroic great engineer inventor. And that story has been kind of systematically debunked by historians over the last 50 or 60 years in all kinds of different sorts of ways. One of the things I feel like I have learned about the British Industrial Revolution uh, over the course, and you're coming back to it in different ways in a number of books now, is the degree to which it really was a product of, of British geography more than anything. That it was, um, you know, Britain is part of this broader West European network of countries that have all got a roughly comparable stock of knowledge, all dealing with a lot of similar economic issues. All of them got rather similar crowds of inventors, well, you know, plenty of differences too, but all of them going down to a rather similar path in the 17th and 18th centuries all of which could potentially have had an industrial revolution somewhere about 1800, learned how to um, convert the heat of burning coal into motion powering pistons and driving machinery, vastly increasing people's productive capacity. Could have happened in any of these places. But the reason it's the British who make this happen first is that the British 
But I mean, and effectively, this is kind of the central story in, in this new book, Geography is Destiny, that the British succeed in effectively moving the British Isles to the center of the world, making it the center of this global network of trade and commerce, and then capitalizing on that. And it's that these flows of revenue coming in from all over the world and what they do internally to Britain, driving up the cost of labor, especially. This yeah. is what gives the incentives that make... Um, uh, tapping into fossil fuels, make it not just something that's possible, but something where the returns to doing this suddenly become so much higher in Britain than anywhere else. This is what kind of pushes um, them over, people over into exploiting this before anybody else on the European continent. So I would say it is all very much a product of kind of the central storyline in my book, which is how um, like geography drives history, but history also drives geography. What um, yeah. The way the societies change, change what the maps mean. And that's what really is driving the story. Well, one of the things you mentioned is the rise of coal and coal mining and how how much coal the, the Brits had at, readily available. And do you think that was one of the things that drove the Industrial Revolution also? Yes, um, in, in a sense, because uh, this is always the problem with trying to focus on a single thing as, as driving mm -hmm. these huge uh, uh, consequences, that they're always bundled up and a lot more stuff going on as well. So yes, definitely, it matters a great deal that Britain has relatively cheap coal compared to a lot of other places. But of course, Britain has always had all this coal. You know, Britain, large parts of the British Isles are lumps of coal with a little bit of soil thinly scattered on top. Yeah. And for most of history, this has been really bad. This is a really bad side effect of geography because it means you can't grow all yeah. that much. It's not super fertile. Soil washes away um, very easily. Um, so for most of British history, this is kind of a bad thing, that bad card that geography has dealt people in the British Isles. Yeah. It only suddenly turns into a good thing because the way societies have developed by the 18th century suddenly make having huge amounts of coal really, really useful. Um, like all that coal is no good to you well, it's, it's very little good to you until you've figured out machines that are able to turn the energy released by burning the coal into you boil water to make steam that drives pistons. And then you figure out ways to apply the power of those pistons to textile manufacture, to making iron and steel, making all these different things. So abruptly, Britain's geography starts to change its meaning in the 17th, 18th centuries as these new inventions and new ways of organizing society start to kick in. Hmm. Well, I, are you familiar with um, an article by a historian named Jared Diamond that basically says um, agriculture was the worst mistake in the world? How do you feel about that, with that idea? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I am, I'm one of Jared Diamond's biggest fans, and I'm sure there are many of you on this um, Zoom will have read Guns, Gems and Steel, or if you haven't, you, you really should. It's a fantastic book. And um, one of his great achievements, and uh, historians have been thinking about geography and thinking as a long-term evolutionary uh, ways, you know, ever since Herodotus. This is not a new idea at all, but what Jared Diamond did in Guns, Gems and Steel was really kickstart a whole new school of thought, thinking about mm. geography and history. And so I, like a lot of people, I'm you know, very much in his debt on, on this. Um, but yes, his, his uh, argument about uh, agriculture being the worst mistake in the history of the human race, the, in human, the whole of human history, says, um, I think, uh, I guess I would not entirely agree with it. Uh, you can see why uh, a rational person might say that, that um, after the agricultural revolution begins, which is about getting up to 10,000 years ago uh, in the Middle East initially, um, for the first time you start to get really pronounced differences between rich and poor. Differences between men and women just explode. Patriarchy is created as part of the initial agricultural revolution. Slavery, serfdom, debt bondage, all these other things begin. Um, the, the, the roots of factory farming for plants and for animals are right there. There's just a lot of stuff going on that most of us mm -hmm. on the whole don't approve of all that much and kind of wish that we didn't live in a world where these things were going on. But to call it a mistake, um, that implies there are other options out there um, that would have had preferable outcomes and would not have been vastly more costly than the route that was taken. And that, hmm. I think, is just not the case. That when you look at what's going on in the, the Middle East at the end of the Ice Age, 
and yes people do choose to start reorganizing their families so they're, they're more patriarchal people do choose to reduce other people to slavery people do choose to start farming rather than hunting and gathering but um, the odds are stacked so heavily in favor of doing those things that it's really hard to see how history could not have gone that way. And, and I'm a big believer in saying, you know, historians, you should just never use the word inevitable. There are always options. Nothing, we're never forced to do anything. It's just that, like, if I you know, come over to your house and hold a gun to your head and say, do X or I'll shoot you, I'm not forcing you to do it. It's just that you weigh up the costs and benefits and say, well, doing X is much less costly than having my brains blown out. So yeah. I think it works now. And that yeah. is kind of, that's the way history works. People make rational choices. I mean, that's the way geography impacts on our lives. Like, mm. Geography is destiny, but it's up to us to choose what to do about it. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, okay, so I think I, we want to take some questions from the audience, but I have one last question. And that is, um, do you think that English people have any qualities that seem unique to them? <laughs> well, now that's probably something you should ask to somebody who's not from England. I <laughs> way to do this. But um, well, the, the English certainly tend to think they have qualities that uh, other people don't have. And I tend to be a little bit skeptical about this, at least at the sort of larger scale. And, and this is one of the themes that I've sort of banged on about repeatedly in the books that I've been writing that seems to me if you take a large group of people from one time or one place and drop it down in some other time or some other place, that group of people is not going to be that different from the people they, they're surrounded by. I think the hmm. distribution of energy and laziness and altruism and selfishness and all these other different uh, kind of personality qualities, these are pretty randomly distributed around the planet. I think mean, you, know, you take any two people, they can be as different as you can possibly imagine. Take two groups of a million people, they're going to be pretty much the same. But of course, what, what does change, the people remain basically the same, because what does change is where the people are and when they happen to be living. And so, like, say, uh, in the, the 18th century, um, one of the big new buzzwords in Western Europe in the 18th century is politeness. Everybody is told, well, other, not everybody, educated people are talking constantly about politeness. And what they mean by that is uh, they're drawing a contrast between themselves and um, what, what their vision is of people in the 17th century. People in the 17th century are not polite. Everybody agrees on that. People in the 17th century had suffered from what 18th century guys call enthusiasm. They'd had a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> enthusiasm leads you to do things like burn witches at the stake and fight mm. civil wars over some incredibly complicated nuance of how you were supposed to believe in God. And all, all these things, people are enthusiastic and they are constantly killing each other over their enthusiasms. By the 18th century, um, educated people, the sort of leaders in society, starting to say, we need to <laughs> step back from enthusiasm. We mm. need to be more polite more rational, more reasonable. We want a, you know, a reasonable and polished God. We don't want this wild, angry, Old Testament oh. kind of guy who's telling us mm -hmm. to smite our enemies on a daily basis. Of course, I mean, some people disagree. They go off and become Methodists or Baptists or whatever. But <laughs> on the whole, I mean, the Church of England especially, we want a reasonable, fair-minded, decent God, the kind of God who could drop round for a cup of tea on a Sunday afternoon. And tea, tea is an 18th century drink. The British weren't drinking tea before the 18th century, at least hardly at all. Um, and so they start, the English start to see themselves as more polite, more reasonable than their European neighbours, mm -hmm. and particularly more than their Celtic neighbours in Scotland, Wales, mm -hmm. and Ireland. And um, there actually is something to this. It's not, this is not entirely a fantasy that the English make up. As this is a big part of the, the constitutional reordering that goes on across the 18th century, making England, I mean, the English constitution of the 18th century is just you know, horrendous to anyone who's used to a modern democracy. You could not live 10 minutes in that country. But compared to most other places, it looks pretty damn good. Um, mm. But this was a place where the disabilities that would be placed on you for having the wrong religion, are generally a lot weaker than they are in most other Western mm -hmm. countries at this point. The disabilities put on women in a lot of ways are not as severe as they are in a lot of other countries. And it's like that there's a growing awareness among the elite that um, 
if the country is going to succeed on the terms that we are now setting, become the centre of global trade, we have to open up our institutions, make them more reasonable and polite, and make uh, government not be entirely a tool for the enrichment of the people that are in the government. It certainly is going to stay that, but it's also a tool designed to encourage other people to enrich themselves in a way that will increase the national wealth and national power. I mean, it's no accident that Adam Smith is British and Scottish, not English. But no accident that Adam Smith is British. This is a sort of thinking, you know, the idea that the way to increase wealth is by having the biggest possible market with the finest possible division of labour. And so um, shutting other people out of your markets, this is actually a bad idea. And it, it's no accident that it's the British who are the first ones to start thinking these mm. words. And so there actually was something to their idea about um, being more polite than other people. And more funny. <laughs> That's a more, much more recent development. Um, is that true? Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so well, Wodehouse know. started it all? B.G. Wodehouse <laughs> started it all? Well, the British humour thing does go back a long way in this sort of pride in having better sense of humour than foreigners. But it's really, there's a great book about this by a, a historian named Dominic Sandbrook called The Great British Culture Factory that I um, oh. reread several times while I was writing. And he points out this remarkable thing that, you know, like if you look at um, indices of military power and economic power and so on, Britain is usually in the top 10, but usually in the lower half of the top 10 nowadays. But you look at um, indices of soft power of like the ability to persuade people to want to want what your country wants without blowing them up or closing down their banks or anything like that britain tends to come in number one or number two in almost all of these indices and so sandbox says oh why why is this because if you go back 100 years people do not feel this way about the british go back 200 years absolutely not. i mean britain is perfidious albion it is not the yeah. home of John Cleese and all these sorts of nice you know, Spice Girls, mm -hmm. and Manchester United and all these good things. And this is, uh, um, Sam Brock shows this is very much a post-World War II development, that as oh, really? Britain retreats from its hard power position in the world, it becomes a lot less scary. And it's not like anybody is consciously making decisions about this, but one of the ways the British adapt to this new meaning that their, their geography has for them now. One of the ways they adapt to this is by becoming this these huge promoters of soft power and um, generating these new genres or taking over older genres um, mm -hmm. and making them distinctly British ones. So like say, uh, you know, uh, rock music is, I think, the, the classic one. Yeah. But you know, up till the end of the 50s, this is so, uh, rock and roll is so American. I'm just 100% American. And then the British are able to break in and, I mean, not, not take over the whole industry, but to a spectacular degree, the British start punching above their weight in popular music. And the other one, the, the, the big one, I think, is Christmas. Because Christmas, as we now understand, it is a British invention. Charles Dickens mentioned is, that in the book. I think that was fascinating. Yeah, I became obsessed with it. The, the, the British basically invent the modern idea of Christmas as a celebration that is sort of religious, but it's primarily about the family and generosity and love and prosperity and well-being. This is what it's really about. Dickens's Christmas Carol, you know, we tend to think of this as a sort of just summing up this nice squishy picture of Christmas. But it was a pioneering book, revolutionizing the way British people thought about Christmas. And then it spreads over in you know, large parts of the planet. And then the British, we lose the Christmas war. Um, after the Second World War, the Americans just kick the Brits behind on the Christmas <laughs> war. Um, partly because of all the new media that gets invented. And so mm. yeah, the British have got Christmas cards and Christmas stories locked down firmly, but the British don't have Christmas movies down. And in the late 40s, mid and late 40s, the Americans totally take over the Christmas movie field. And then in the early 1960s, totally take over the Christmas TV field. But then more <laughs> recently, there's been a British fight back on the Christmas front. And I personally think that Love Actually, which came out in 2003, is probably the I love that book. I love that movie. movie. I love that movie. Fantastic movie. So, so yeah, this is this extraordinary transformation of a country that had been fairly universally loathed and feared 150 years ago into wow. one that, um, I mean, people feel not only are they not scared of Britain now, but like the British are one of the few people in the world who it's okay to make fun of. 
And you know, even <laughs> a touchy feely place like Stanford, I'm sure Harvard is just as bad. Um, okay, let's stop there and have questions. I love, I love that stopping with the idea that the British are wonderful to make fun of. So please ask questions. Um, uh, type them in. You can type them in down below in the chat area. Oh, no, I see the Q&A area. Yes. Um, okay, number one. Um, was, was there anything that ended up on the cutting room floor for the book that you wish you could have included? Yes. Uh, yeah. Now I I write in a really weird way. Uh, like everybody will tell you. Like I just read this thing in the New Yorker um, uh, about James Patterson's autobiography that just came out. And apparently, uh, the, the the review was complaining that Patterson actually says almost nothing in his book about how he writes, which you think is like the most interesting thing about the guy. He says almost nothing about that. But the one thing he does say is outline, outline, outline. Whenever you're writing, you, know, you outline, and then you outline your outlines. You carry on until he said that with the first of his books, it was a really big hit. He kept writing outlines. He got more and more detailed until he realized, oh, I basically got the book here. And that's how he kind of came up with this style, this sort of relentless forward movement of the plot with very little sketching of characters or anything. I was just boom, 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 stuff happens. Um, I, unfortunately, I am just the opposite. But I would seriously sit down. I've done this with more than one of my books. Sit down with an envelope and start sketching out where I think the overall shape of the book will go. And then I get impatient before I get to the end of the envelope and start writing it, um, which is a terrible way to write. And it causes me to waste huge amounts of time. And it's the only way I can do it. I kind of tended to stick with this. But the result of that is I, I rewrite. I mean, Patterson's outline, outline, outline. Mine would be rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. Rewrite things dozens and dozens of times. So almost everything I write ends up on the cutting room floor. And yeah. sometimes um, it is a rather sad, <laughs> sad thing. When you, you, you've labored for a long time to get a bit just right, you're really happy with it. Then you realize, well, you know, honestly, this doesn't need to be there. And sometimes it's something where I feel that, that segment, maybe a couple of pages or whatever, I feel that, that segment, it maybe works really well as a segment, but not as part of this chapter. It slows mm -hmm. it down it, or it distracts you off the central mm -hmm. storyline. So then I've got to come up with some often rather contrived segue to get us back onto the central mm -hmm. storyline. So the thing to do, obviously, is cut it. And the one, the one that broke my heart uh, in this new book was <clears throat> in the midst of going on and on about King Arthur, which I was having such a good time doing, I got off on this thing about early Anglo-Saxon housing, which might not sound the most gripping topic in the world, but I think it's really, really fascinating. Yeah, I do too. These, these, these houses, they come out, and this is a sort of weird thing, they come over, they take, uh, come over mostly from northern Germany, Denmark area, take over the Roman province of Britannia as it's crumbling to pieces. And according to the stories that get written by the writers living over the next few centuries, because we have no real contemporary accounts, and, you know, they, they win all these military victories against the, uh, the, the British population. And so these guys, the Anglo-Saxons, they've got to be pretty well organized to do all this. But then you look at the houses they lived in. Basically, what they do is they dig a hole in the ground they put some wood on the bottom of it then they build some sh sh um, fairly low walls of wood above the ground they dig the hole in the ground because that's cheaper than building a tall house you want a house like six feet tall so you can walk around in it cheapest way is dig a hole three feet deep in the ground then you've only got to build a three foot wall oh. so they do this and then they live in it now, wow. if you want to get pneumonia and chill brains and rheumatism, go to England, dig a three foot hole, <laughs> deep hole in the ground and sleep in it over the winter. It's going to kill you. Oh. And so how could they possibly have taken over large parts of Britain if they couldn't even keep the rain out of their houses? I just got totally fascinated with this. And um, what, because you know, I shouldn't go on and on about this, but one of the things that makes it so fascinating is that some historians have concluded that the stories about the Anglo-Saxons taking over large parts of England just can't possibly be true. That this has got to be um, something that British writers invented. It's not that they totally invent the Anglo-Saxons, but they basically invent the story of the Anglo-Saxons coming over and taking over the whole country, which is a, a great thing for a historian because you can get into these very complicated arguments and everything about all the details of the texts. But sadly for the historians, um, ancient DNA has just killed this argument dead. A lot of Anglo-Saxons came, they killed a lot of people and they chased a lot more away. 
But anyway, yeah, that, that all had to go, which made me okay, very Hey, that had to go. All right, next question. Um, is there anything in particular about studying Greek archaeology that prepared you, perhaps in an unexpected way, to write about British history? What a great question. Um, and that is something, obviously, I should have thought about since it's my life. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk, you write about it in your autobiography. Yeah, 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 which I'm sure will sell just as well as James Patterson's. But, um, <laughs> I, I have no idea. What a great question. I, I am going to think about that. Um, I think certainly being a, an archaeologist in general, um, I found it's a very good preparation for historians. And all historians should be made to get some serious training as archaeologists mm -hmm. because it just makes you look at the world in a very, very different way. It's like in one way it makes you much more detail oriented than even the most detail oriented historian. Because like when you're excavating, you can spend three or four seasons excavating a single room. And there's all this stuff that went on in that room that you can't possibly know about. But certain things, the things that leave a material residue behind, you know about them in a level of detail that no historian ever knows about anything just from written sources. So in some ways you really zoom down into the details, but in other ways, because you're not dealing with the sort of differences of language and genre and culture that you get in written documents, archaeology is much more comparative and long-term kind of thing. That, I think, is great preparation for the historian. It helps you sort of leap a little bit out of, um, I, I say this as a historian, leap a little bit out of the silos that almost all historians get them into. So mm. yes, yeah, being an archaeologist, I think, is a very good thing. Being a Greek archaeologist in particular, I'm going to have to think about that and come up with some clever answer. Okay. Um, and the third question is, what do you think American audiences should know about Brexit that they might not know? Yeah, I guess I would say the big thing to think about um, it's something that <clears throat> I think that a lot of people do have a sense of this. The, the way that Brexit is a response to changing meanings of geography that are also affecting the United States. Brexit, you know, it's, a, it's a uniquely British phenomenon in that obviously there's nothing like the EU in North America for, uh, for the US to leave. Although, I mean, you, if you want to stretch things a bit, you could say you're leaving NAFTA and some of the other um, large treaties that we backed out of. That is, is in certain ways comparable to Brexit. But um, I think you one of the, the things that's happened, I mean, in fact, the central storyline in the book is that um, you know, the, the basic geography of the British Isles hasn't changed all that much in the last six or eight thousand years since things stabilised after the end of the Ice Age. But what that geography means has constantly changed over that period. And so most of British history, in fact, all of British history up to about 500 years ago, is driven by the fact that the British Isles are only just off the coast of Europe and by the fact that the English Channel operates more as a highway than a barrier. Anybody who gets to the continental side can get across to the, the English side. English history, British history is just an extension of what happens on the continent. Like basically, English history is about what comes the way of the English from Europe. The history of the Scots, Welsh and Irish is about what comes their way from England. And that's kind of the whole story right up to mm -hmm. 500 years ago. And then what happens at that point is um, new technology, new organizations change the meanings of that geography. And in particular, the British and the new kind of ships come on the scene that allow you to close the English Channel while opening up the oceans for trade, uh, opening up the possibility of Britain kind of taking itself out of Europe by closing the English Channel. But the only way you can do that is if you also create these new organizations that have enough money to pay for keeping fleets at sea for long periods, which are powerful governments. Mm -hmm. And a lot of English people really, really don't want that because, of course, a government powerful enough to build those fleets is also powerful enough to reach into your pocket to get the money to pay for the fleets. Yeah. So 16th and 17th centuries, all this violence in England driven by basically this this question of you know, we're beginning to see what the changing meaning of geography where it could take us do we want to go that way and Ooh. the english eventually decided yes we do um and secure behind it a moat defensive what shakespeare called it and there's no coincidence shakespeare <clears throat> writing at the end of the 16th century just as it becomes possible to think of the english channel as a moat mm. and secure behind that moat rulers in london take over the whole of the british isles create this global empire uh, and then 
the, the last part of the story is the world changes again as technology and organization keep um, developing, world keeps shrinking. Um, the Atlantic Ocean goes from being like a British pond to being once increasingly dominated on the American side. The Pacific Ocean starts doing the same kind of thing. Britain gets pushed off the top of this pile. The US becomes the great dominant player. Now I would say that we are living in a world where the way geography is going, the way it's changing its meanings, there's like three great mountains of money in the world, one in North America, one in Western Europe, and one in East Asia. And the story in the 21st century is going to be about the relationships between these three mountains of money. And for mm. the British, what that means is you know, the way historians will judge Brexit, I think, is by how well did it position the British Isles to operate in a world that is increasingly dominated by this Chinese mountain of money. For North America, though, for the, for the US, um, what it means is American governments have to recognize the way these forces of organization technology are changing what the map means. And um, they have to recognize that the 21st century is going to be about the relationship with China. And that you know, obviously has begun to happen already. And going back to the, the mid 2010s, we've seen this marked hardening of American attitudes toward China and, and marked hardening of Chinese attitudes toward the rest of the world as well. And I think historians looking at 2020s USA, uh, historians of the future looking back at 2020s USA, they are going to judge what policies the country pursues in the same way that historians of the future are going to judge Brexit. They're going to say, did that help or did that not help mm -hmm. in dealing with the rising power and wealth of China? And of course, the great question on the table at the moment is that we just don't know what is the best way to deal with the great yeah. rise of China. Is it tr by trying to contain it? Is it by trying to cooperate with it? Is it something else? You know, th this, I think this is the great question that geography is now forcing on the United States. Well, now that you say the word geography, I'm going to ask one last question. This is my own question, which is I'm wondering how you think climate change is going to transform the ecosystem as well as the human civilization in the British Isles. Yeah, well, you, you can already see this happening. You go back there, it is just so much hotter than it used to be. And this mm. last couple of days is like up in the 90s, hotter in London than it was in California. And there's something wow. really weird is going on. And I think you know, people in Britain are, are perfectly well aware of this. And so you know, that, that's the obvious thing that's going on. I think some of the things that climate change are going to do um, is you know, climate change is reconfiguring the meaning of geography for the northern hemisphere by opening up these northern sea lanes. And that has you know, immediate consequences, particularly for Canada and Russia, but also knock on effects for country and then Scandinavia, knock on effects for countries a little bit further south. So that's going to make a big difference, too. But I might guess if I had to put my mind on this, my guess would be to say that the really big consequence of geopolitics of climate change, no, actually, uh, back up, two, two really big consequences. One is going to be the migration flows, that you know, pretty much everybody's looked into this, agrees. We're going to see um, you know, hundreds of millions of people relocating from um, Africa, from parts of Central and South Asia, from Central and South America, and countries like Britain and the US are among the most favoured destinations for these refugee flows, and that is going to make a really big difference. Mm -hmm. and the other really big thing going on sort of within the great powers is um, climate change is pressing new kinds of energy concerns onto us, and um, whoever gets in first with green energy and new kinds of batteries and all, you know, all the other like magical technological things that are going on. This, I think this is going to be like being the first mover back in the original industrial revolution at the beginning mm. of the 19th century. Britain gets its global power largely because it reacts in the way that it does to the changing meanings of geography, turns itself into an industrial power. Mm. And for a you know, 30, 40, 50 year period, Britain is really the only industrial power that matters on the planet. And so, of course, Britain dominates the planet. Um, the way things are going at the moment, I do worry rather a lot that the United States is not going to take the pole position in the new green yeah, economy. I worry about that too. Especially with recent articles in the New York Times about that. But anyway, ending on a depressing note. <laughs> However, um, I, I do want to say one last time, this is a wonderful book to read. 
I'm sure that everybody will enjoy it. It just goes along smoothly and amusingly. And I, I think it's a great book. And I want to thank Harvard for letting me introduce you. But also, I want to thank you for writing this book, because I think it's a wonderful book. Well, thank you so much. And thank, thank you for uh, asking these wonderful questions. This has been a lot of fun. Good. Uh, and thank you both for such an interesting conversation and a wonderful way to spend our Monday evening. Um, and thank you to everyone out there who joined us tonight. Um, you can learn more about um, the book and purchase it at harvard.com or via the link that I put in the chat. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a great night, keep reading, and please be well, everyone. Thanks yes, so much. Please. Thank, thank you. you.